Thank you. Okay, so as Ravi Zacharias mentioned, uh, differences are fundamental, similarities are superficial. Here's the major areas of differences, and we're going to go through each one more in depth. So you have uh, some T-charts that will follow, uh, each of these focusing on the differences between uh, the Christian worldview and understanding and the Islamic worldview and understanding. Okay, so uh, we'll just go one by one down these T-charts. Uh, so much different understanding of the nature of God. Of course, there's some things we can agree on, like God is all-powerful, but there's many things we will disagree on. Uh, obviously, we believe as Christians uh, that God is a triune God, uh, that he is one in his being or his essence or his nature or his substance, but that he expressed himself in three persons, three coexistent, co-eternal, co-equal persons. Um, Islam would call this blasphemy. Uh, and they say God is one and he is only one with absolute unity, singularity, self-subsistence, uh, and he does not have any partner. Uh, at one point it is said that uh, someone came up to Muhammad, uh, the prophet of Islam, and said, Muhammad, who is your God? Who is our Allah? And so he revealed Surah 112. So Surah 112, chapter 112 in the Quran, is meant to answer that exact question. Uh, and so it's a really short one. Um, the later ones are very short, and so I will quickly read it. He is Allah, the one and the only, Allah, the eternal, the absolute. He is begotten not. No, he is not begotten. Meaning, of course, well, he's not made or created. And there is none like unto him. As you can tell, we'll see that the Quran does not read the easiest, even in the best of translations. Um, right, and so uh, they call this doctrine Tawheed, the absolute singularity of God. Okay, uh, point two, uh, as Christians, we believe that uh, God really does feel and display love, that he's moved to compassion uh, for all people, for those who hate him and for those who love him, uh, for those who are enemies and those who are his friends. He loves all. Um, but for the Muslim, God feels and displays love and compassion on those who are nice to him, those who are obedient to him, those who follow him, right? And so uh, I will read real quick Surah 4, Ayah 36, because uh, this is the one oftentimes I'll love to point my friends to. This is a question I'd love to ask my Muslim friends. Does your God, does your Allah love everyone? Surah 36. Excuse me, Ayah 36. Serve Allah and join not any partners with him. And do good to parents, orphans, those in need, and neighbors. Uh, even neighbors who are strangers. Allah loves not the arrogant. Allah loves not the arrogant. And so if there's one of, me, one of you in here who is arrogant, then the God of Islam does not love and he does not like you. I'll oftentimes counter by saying, that's crazy. I think I can love better than Allah. Because I have friends who are arrogant, and I love them. Do I love better than Allah? Right? God only loves in Islam those who are, first of all, obedient to him. Those who are committed Muslims. Uh, in Christianity, God is bound by his character traits. Um, meaning, God, of course, is omnipotent. He can do all things, um, but he can't do things that are unloving. Um, right? uh, he's not going to do things that compromise his character and who he is, uh, because he is bound by the very things that are true of his nature. Uh, in Islam, God is not bound by his character or traits. He simply acts how he wants, uh, and it's good because God does it. It's not good because it's good. So uh, the Islamic God uh, can act in a vengeful way, and it's good because God did it. Allah did it, therefore it's good. It's not bad because it's vengeful. It's good because Allah did it. Right? Uh, so they will say that Allah is, and they have many, many names for him, uh, many things that he does. But that doesn't mean that he always is loving. That means at times he can act loving. But he's not always bound to act loving. That's the nature of the Islamic God. Uh, in Christianity, uh, God ultimately wants relationship with his people. In Islam, he ultimately wants submission. Huge key difference. Uh, in Christianity, God is knowable. That's why he gave us the Bible. It's his self-revelation. He's telling us who he is. Uh, in Islam, God is unknowable, 
and uh, his holy scriptures do not tell us who he is. It simply tells us what he decrees or what he wills. All right, next difference is uh, the nature of Jesus. Uh, in Christianity, obviously, we know Jesus as the Son of God. That's a title we give to him. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we believe that he's the second person of the triune Godhead, uh, that he is uncreated, that he is not a creation, but he is a creator, uh, and that he existed into eternity past. Uh, Islam believes that Jesus cannot have uh, the title, the Son of God, uh, because this would mean that God had a wife. Surah 6, Ayah 101, says, To him is due the primal origin of heavens and earth. How can he, speaking of Allah, have a son when he has no consort or no wife? He created all things. How can he have a son when he has no wife? Uh, this shows the understanding that Muhammad had of what it meant when Christians used the title Son of God. Uh, we'll get into this more, but uh, he thought that had to mean that since Jesus was the Son and Allah, or God the Father, was a father, there had to be some sort of wife involved. Um, interesting. Uh, Christianity, uh, Jesus perceived himself to be fully God, knew those who heard him uh, and made this claim, knew that he was fully God. Uh, according to Surah 19, uh, Ayah 30, uh, Surah 19 is actually called Surah al Maryam, uh, which is the chapter of Mary. Uh, Muslims believe that they honor Mary more than we do, as they say, because they named a chapter after her. And then they'll say, do you have a book or a chapter in your Bible named after Mary? No, they don't. Uh, Ayah 30. Allah said, excuse me, Jesus said, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He has given me revelation, and he has made me only a prophet. Right? Uh, he actually said those words uh, from his crib, just so you knew, um, according to the Quran. Uh, Jesus spoke uh, right after he was put in the manger. Um, he, 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 spoke, he spoke from the manger, uh, and he said those words right there. Uh, then I am no more than a prophet. From Surah 19, I heard. Next, uh, we believe, obviously, key that Jesus died on a cross for the sins of mankind. Uh, Islam believes that Jesus did not die on a cross, of course. Uh, it was only one who looked at him. Uh, first of all, I'll read the text. This is a very, very important uh, ayah in the Quran. Surah 4, ayah 157. They said in boast, they meaning Christians, Christians say, we killed, excuse me, Jews. They say in boast, Jews say, we killed Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But we know they killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them. It's a key phrase right there. They thought they killed him. They thought they crucified him, but they killed him and they crucified him not. It was made to appear to them. So many Muslim scholars um, have many different views as to what exactly this means. Uh, the most commonly held version is one of two, um, that uh, they crucified, uh, yeah. The most, uh, the most known is that they crucified someone who God made look like Jesus immediately, and that God pulled Jesus up to heaven, kind of at the time where there was the wrestling and the scuffling of them trying to arrest Jesus. The Romans had come, and they were trying to arrest him. God didn't want this to happen, and so in order to save Jesus, he pulled him up to heaven real quick, and then he made someone else look like Jesus right away, so then that person who looked like Jesus was the one who was crucified. Um, another interpretation is that uh, in the scuffle that was happening somehow right as God pulled Jesus up, he pulled him up in spirit, which left Jesus' flesh and somehow someone shoved Judas, and then Judas kind of got thrown into Jesus' flesh, and so it was actually the person of Judas that looked like Jesus, and then that was the individual who was crucified. But why do they care if he's just a prophet and not God? Is that the whole, like, how Jesus will come back later on as the Messiah to judge the world? Is that why they, they, why do they care? Why, why do they care if, if he dies on the cross or not? Um, we can get that a little bit later. Yes. On the app, it says in parentheses the messenger of Allah. Is that? Yeah. So a lot of the apps that you have, uh, when you read the reading the Quran, is somewhat difficult actually. 
you have to understand just a few things because it reads really weird um, from what we're used to reading the Bible. Uh, for example, whenever you see the term we, it's God speaking, it's Allah speaking. I said, we said, for some reason we refers to Allah. Um, and so there's some weird odd things. But yeah, oftentimes when you're reading uh, any English translation of the Quran uh, on those apps, it'll have things in parentheses. Those are normally um, commentaries that are added by scholars in order to add clarification, uh, but it's not something that's in the original version of the Quran, as they would say. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a way for them to, in a sense, tamper with how you understand certain texts, but still say, oh, it's just our commentaries. So would they say that Jesus was a false prophet or a true prophet who just wasn't God? Oh, he was a true prophet. He was false in the sense that he was falsely attributed divinity. All right, the nature of Jesus, uh, we just finished. Uh, the nature of man, this one's huge, um, right? Uh, the doctrine of man in Christianity is that man is created by God, unique from all the rest of creation. After God had created all, that he said something, and he pronounced something over man that he didn't pronounce over anything else, right? And that was that they were made in the image of God, they're made in his likeness. Uh, there is no such doctrine or understanding in Islam, uh, which sounds kind of minor, uh, but there is kind of a practical outworking of it uh, that is important. Uh, all right, second difference, uh, we believe, obviously, as Christians, uh, that man is corrupt, <laughs> left to their own devices. Uh, all man is corrupt, evil, wicked, selfish, um, inherently bad. Right? This is Romans 3 in a microcosm. Uh, Islam has a much different understanding. Uh, they believe men are imperfect, but to say that they are inherently bad, they believe, is going way too far. Left to their own devices, man is, they're just, they're just weak, and they're forgetful. So the reason that oftentimes you don't obey a law is not because you're corrupt at your core or your nature, but rather that you forget, oftentimes, a lot of the commands. Um, or you're just ignorant. Maybe you don't actually even know them. So that's the reason that you're not as obedient to Allah as you should be. Right? So uh, this is embodied in Surah 4, Ayah 28, which says, um, Allah doth wish to lighten your difficulties. Man was created weak in his flesh. Okay? Man is, man, man's weak. You're weak, but you're not inherently sinful. Okay? Um, this works itself out in a lot of ways. I remember I was praying with uh, my friend Bender uh, a few weeks ago. It was the last time I would see him. He's a Saudi student here um, who I had spent many, many years sharing the gospel with. Uh, I was praying over him before he left, um, and in my prayer I said something along the lines of, uh, Lord, we have all hated you and been enemies and rebelled against you. And at the end he goes, who has hated God? I said, what? He said, you said that we have hated God. I have never hated God. And I said, well, the Bible says that simply by our disobedience to God and our sinful nature, we have hated God. I have never hated him. I've always loved him, right? There is the mind, there's the thinking of a Muslim. Uh, all men, even prophets, engage in sin, of course. Uh, Islam believes that prophets live perfect lives, free and exempt from sin, or at least any major sin. Uh, this does get a little tricky. That's usually the commonly held view, but some people say things that are slightly different. Uh, for example, it gets kind of sticky because the Quran actually does have the story of Moses killing a man. Um, and so when you ask them how to deal with that, they say, well, Allah decreed it, or he willed it for Moses for that specific time. Therefore, it was not sinful that Moses killed that man. Uh, that's how they normally deal with it, right? So all prophets, I believe, live perfect lives, which luckily includes Jesus. So they believe that Jesus was perfectly righteous. Uh, a Muslim scholar says a quote that's very telling right here. Man is born in a natural state of purity. Whatever becomes of man after birth is a result of external influence and intruding factors. So you're bad, not because you were born bad, but because certain factors made you bad. Well, that makes you say, well, how did those factors become bad? And shouldn't there be some group that's essentially at its good core and stays uncorrupted? They have no answer. Uh, Adam disobeyed the divine commandment through forgetfulness, not intentionally. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, and so Adam's sin, which is a story they do have in the Quran, it's a little bit divergent from the Bible story, but it, it's somewhat similar. Um, he disobeyed because he forgot. 
not because he intentionally wanted to act selfishly. Very, very distinct differences. Uh, nature of salvation, um, all this can basically be summed up pretty easily, right? Based on faith alone and Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, uh, essentially based on works, right? Man's fa fundamental problem in Christianity is sin, in Islam it's weakness. Uh, we believe all humans are deserving of death. In Islam, since they're just kind of weak, then not really. You know, it, it's kind of harsh to say that every man is deserving of hell. We believe, obviously, humans can be right, made right with God only through faith in Jesus. It's our sole basis. Uh, Islam believes humans can be made right with God through a belief, excuse me, a combination of belief and action. Um, so the belief includes the six articles of faith, as well as pronouncing the shahada. There is no God but one Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, as well as action. So you have to do the five pillars. How often, how regularly, how much can you mess up? We're not for sure. It's kind of fuzzy. Right? In Christianity, because our standing is based on Christ's given to us, not based on us, we can be assured of our eternal destiny. Islam, not so much. Uh, one can be assured... One cannot be assured in, certain, in Islam of their salvation since it depends entirely on their own religious effort and devotion. Uh, a very telling verse or ayah that shows this to be true is ayah 46. Excuse me, Surah 46, ayah 9. says, this is the words of Muhammad. Uh, if you're reading the Quran, again, if it says say and then it has little quotes, that means Muhammad is speaking. Why? I don't know. This is how they do it. So Muhammad is speaking in chapter 46, verse 9. I am no bringer of newfangled doctrine, or new doctrine, among the messengers. I don't have anything new. This is what all the prophets said. Nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. Right? So Muhammad says, I don't know what will what, be done with me after I die. Or you, my closest followers. I don't know what will be done with any of you. Right? Muhammad himself did not know and could not know what his eternal destiny was. Uh, again, Muslims would call this statement by Christians to be very, very blasphemous. Right? Um, the typical view, uh, I'll go ahead and read this right here, uh, because this is very telling. Uh, Surah 23, Ayah 102, uh, shows a picture, and this is how most Muslims think. Uh, again, Learning how to share the gospel with Muslims isn't just about learning their doctrine, what they're learning now, but learning how do they think? How do they process? So, uh, okay. It says, then those whose balance, so it's talking about the end times, then those whose balance of good deeds is heavy, they will attain salvation. But those whose balance is light will be those who have lost their souls in hell. They will abide forever, or in hellfire, as they oftentimes say. Uh, Muslims are the best hellfire brimstone preachers. So, yeah, the, the typical view they see is literally that of a scale, right? It's um, kind of the religion of our age in a lot of ways is Islam, right? Good deeds, you can go to heaven. Bad deeds, hell is a... I won't read the next one, uh, but this one essentially is a story uh, that many Muslims believe to be true. Uh, it's a story of two angels, one on your right shoulder, one on your left shoulder. Every time you do a good deed, your angel on the right shoulder writes. Every time you do a bad deed, the angel on your left shoulder writes. Uh, eventually, come judgment day, uh, you'll come face to face with Allah. The scrolls will be rolled out, and whichever scroll is longer will be the scroll that determines where you're going to spend eternity. Uh, one time, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine uh, named Migrin, and um, Migrin was, as he told me, a devout Muslim. Uh, yet, <laughs> I think I ran to him at Aggieville. I was at Varsity Truck, and he had been doing a lot of things that weren't Varsity Truck. Um, and he was in not so great a state, but he could yet talk with me. And uh, I just wanted to kind of poke and pry. And I said, uh, Migrin, is it true that you've uh, had some alcohol to drink tonight? Yes, yes, yes. It's true. And uh, I said, do you not fear a lot? And he goes, oh, I most definitely do. And I said, is not the angel on your left shoulder writing? And he goes, 
I am ashamed. Okay? Mind of a Muslim. Uh, nature of scriptures. Right, so we believe that uh, scriptures have both a divine component and a human component, that they're fully, completely inspired by God, uh, but yet God also used humans and their preferences and uh, their history in order to shape uh, some of the scriptures as well. He didn't uh, in any way negate those. Uh, Islam believes that the scriptures have only and exclusively a divine component. Uh, Muhammad was nothing but a blabbering mouthpiece. Uh, in fact, the word that describes inspiration in Islam is tanzil. Uh, it's a word that means downloaded, essentially, or brought down, right? They believe that the Quran was a book that existed in heaven into eternity past. It was uncreated, um, and literally it was just downloaded into the mind of Muhammad. That he was almost thoughtless as he revealed and as he spoke the words that would eventually be written down and taken <coughs> as the Quran. Uh, so again, he was simply a mouthpiece. Um, we believe the scriptures have been preserved perfectly, but that they have, uh, not perfectly, excuse me, but they have been passed down in a way that's sufficient, trustworthy, and reliable. Hopefully that's not concerning. Okay? Any scholar would admit there's been some difficulty in transmission, but yet yeah, we, we know generally what the message is. The message hasn't been changed. There's no core doctrine that's at question, right? Um that we can't say that every scribe that's ever exists has completely been able to preserve the exact text down to the exact letter and the exact grammatical marks, uh, that there has been, you know, maybe a changing of spelling of a word here, et cetera. Maybe some of the numbers could maybe be changed a little bit from what they originally were, right? But it's been passed down in a way that's sufficient and trustworthy. Uh, Muslims say that their scripture, their scripture has been preserved perfectly. Perfect preservation is a key doctrine for Muslims. Uh, of course, no, not the Christian scriptures preserved perfectly, only theirs, the Quran, uh, and it is exactly the original. So if I were to have an Arabic Quran with me right now, uh, I would hold it up and the Muslim beside me would say, that is the same Quran that was originally written by Muhammad's closest followers, that was spoken by Muhammad, and not even a grammatical mark has been changed over 1400 years becoming very difficult to still uphold this phrase um, and this, this thought. Um, Muslims believe that because they've been told that by everyone that they've ever met and interacted with who's a Muslim, uh, but there's really uh, not a whole lot of evidence to be able to verify this. In fact, uh, almost everyone who knows uh, a decent amount about criticism, textual criticism of the Quran would know that there are uh, differing manuscripts, there are differing final versions of the Quran that exist, even after this day. Yes? Do they hold that to the Hadith, too? As far as it... Perfect preservation? Yeah, or even... No, you have such a wide-ranging understanding of Hadith. Some say they're all inspired, some say none are, some say some, and we can't tell. So, there's really no uh, majority view on the Hadith. Uh, we believe scripture, yes? Um, what is your understanding about Muhammad having, first of all, being illiterate, so that's why he didn't write anything down himself. And second of all, that all of his all of his downloads from God, or most of them, came during epileptic seizures, from which he arose and then uh, spouted the words of God. Well, a Muslim would say, isn't it a miracle that our prophet, who inspired such a book with rhythm and cadence, was illiterate? The main miracle of Muhammad, right, was that an illiterate man was able to bring forth this book that in the book challenges people. It says oftentimes, uh, you are wondering if this is revelation from God? Produce like it a book, and then we will believe that maybe this is not. And no one was able to ever answer the challenge. And then eventually it goes to, you believe this is not revelation from God? Produce like it a single verse, and then we will know. Right, so it's like the the Quran's oftentimes challenging the questioners to produce a single verse like that of the Quran, and then the Muslim always goes, "And never has this been done." I go, "What kind of verse would need to be brought forth?" Um, there actually is a decent amount of um, scholarly work done whether or not Muhammad. Well, I mean, the, the idea that he's illiterate is an idea that we only get through uh, Muslim primary sources. 
but historically it doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, based on some of the things that were true of his life. Um, he would have been he would have been raising uh, he he would have been exposed to a decent amount of wealthy people. We would have thought he probably had an education um, for a few reasons. And so whether or not he was illiterate uh, from a secular point of view really is kind of a question. It's mainly of Muslims that claim he's illiterate. And uh, again, the next point, yes, uh, it seems if oftentimes when he recited uh, that he would go into some sort of seizure-like activity. Uh, in fact, his very first recitation in 610 AD, uh, the very first words of the Quran are recite. And um, it's uh, Surah 96. And uh, apparently the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad, grabbed him by the throat, kind of held him against some sort of cave-like wall and said, recite, recite, recite. Uh, and so it does seem as if he was almost in the, this weird, paranoid-like state um, during his revealing of the Quran, which is, of course, somewhat disturbing, to say the least. <clears throat> yes? Uh, since we're just throwing questions at you, uh, do you have, and push me off if you're going to talk about this later, but uh, any information or thoughts on the Quran referencing like the apocryphal books? So you said Jesus talked in the crib. That was in one of the apocryphal books, yeah, yeah. Or, or the view of Mary. Like yeah. So, from so the Christian understanding is that um, uh, it is true that a lot of uh, stories that exist in the Old Testament and the Bible uh, kind of come up in the Quran. Oftentimes they're abridged. They're much shorter. Um, so like the story of Moses comes up like 28 times. Um, but it's always very brief. It's normally like 10 verses, and um, it definitely doesn't have near the detail at all. And oftentimes it gets a lot of the things wrong. Uh, and so what most, uh, the explanation for this by most Christians is that uh, Muhammad most likely would have been exposed to a lot of Christians uh, as he was uh, running a lot of caravan routes throughout the Arabian Peninsula, mainly between Mecca and Medina. Um, and so he would have heard a lot of possibly Jews, maybe Christians, regardless, Old Testament stories being told. Uh, he also probably would have been heard a lot of apocryphal tales being told as well. Uh, with the Jews and the Christians knowing that they were just that apocryphal tales, but that they existed in the culture. And that Muhammad himself was not actually able or smart enough to sort through which stories were viewed as actually in the Christian or the Jewish texts and which were simply apocryphal. So how would a... Uh, Unless someone would just say, no, of course not, that's silly. Shut up and shut, all right. <laughs> um, uh, where could I find a, a different version, like other than the Uthman Traverse? Because um, I've looked online and I can't find anything. The, uh, the Uthmanic text that's currently in uh, Sana? No. <clears throat> what do you mean? The, the Uthmanic text is. Uh, well, that's the, like the, where the, the translations text. eventually yeah, really, get, okay. and that's how, where we get this from. Yeah. But there are other ones floating around. Before that, and you weren't. Like, mean in Arabic script? Uh, even in English, because I can't read Arabic. But. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when the Quran was first translated to English, but it wasn't obviously until the last yeah. few. I mean, it might have been like fifty years ago, I think. But you were even saying that there are others floating around, like other, other different translations or versions or whatever. Yeah, I'm not for sure. I'd have to look at how to get a hold of those. Okay. I'm not for sure, but. Yeah, the Uthmanic, yeah, we didn't take a while. Okay, so the scriptures uh, can uh, only be understood in the entirety in the original language of Revelation, which was Arabic. And so uh, Gabriel, or excuse me, God revealed through Gabriel to Muhammad the scriptures. He spoke them, and then eventually they were collected, written down, thrown into the book that's called the Quran. Okay, so they believe that this happened in Arabic, therefore the only pure understanding of Islam can come in an understanding of the Arabic language. Um, so oftentimes you'll encounter a problem when you're trying to discuss the Quran with your Arabic speaking Muslim friend and you don't know Arabic and you say, see the text says this and he says, no, it really doesn't. And you say, what does it say? And he goes, I can't explain it to you in the Arabic language, it's too eloquent. That's when you say, is there a better translation that exists? And he says, I would translate it differently. And then you would say, how would you translate it? 
and then normally they won't respond because they know if they say it, then you say, and is that a sufficient message? And if so, then why didn't the translators who were on the translating committee, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, the most trustworthy of all translators, translate it that way? Or you could ask, is your God not great enough to give me his message in my language? He sounds somewhat proficient. Regardless. Uh, this is their understanding of prophets, right? Uh, a lot of the prophets uh, that we have or Old Testament <laughs> characters we have in the narrative they have as well. Uh, they give them different names. Adun, Ibrahim, Musa, Daud, Yahya, Isa, right? But they believe that uh, each one simply prophesied about the next one to come. So Adam predicted Abraham. Adam, Abraham predicted the next guy to come down the line. David predicted the next guy to come down the line. Right, where we obviously believe as Christians that as Jesus said in Luke 24, right, he opened the scriptures and he showed them how the law and the prophets were referring to him. We believe that all testify of Christ. That Adam does so, uh, although not directly, right, the Proto-Evangelium, all the way through Abraham to the Deuteronomic prophet of Moses, all the way to 2 Samuel 7 of David to John the Baptist, all pointing to the one figure who is the very center of the holy text. Right, so we have a much different understanding of how the prophets work and function. Again, to remind you, the quote from Ravi, we are not the same. The God of Islam is not the same God as the God of the Bible. So, what does the Quran say about Christians? What do you guys think? We commit the worst of sins. We commit the sin of, wait for it, shirk, otherwise known as association or partnership. We do the worst because we deny the shahada. There is no God but one Allah. Apparently, we believe in partners of God, according to Muslims and according to Muhammad, right? Because we believe in multiple gods according to Muhammad and according to the Quran. And we associate or we bring as partners other things or other people who aren't God and say that they are like God and should receive worship and reverence like God. And as a result, we will not go to heaven or the paradise, as they oftentimes call it. Uh, I'll read real quick. Surah 3, Ayah 85. Uh, if anyone desires a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of him. And the hereafter, he will be in the ranks of those who have lost all good, and he will be in the hellfire. All right, so if we desire any religion other than Islam, the Shahada, we will be in hell, hellfire. Um, I believe Surah 5, I, 72 specifically says that Ahul al-Kitab, people of the book, which is uh, oftentimes uh, rendered as Christians, understood as Christians, uh, that they will not go to heaven. And as such, we are, get this, according to the Quran, the worst of creatures. Surah 98, Ayah 6 says, Those who reject the truth, people of the book, Christians, and those among the polytheists, of which they are, will be in hellfire. To dwell therein, they are the worst of creatures. That is us. Now, this is somewhat complicated and nuanced. I have many, many, many Muslim friends, and none of them have ever called me the worst of creatures, nor do they think I'm the worst of creatures. Uh, I have a buddy named Hamza, who I had over to my house a while ago, and uh, we were talking and talking for quite a while. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, you know, Ty, you're more righteous than most Muslims I know. You're more devout than most Muslims I know. In fact, I believe if you continue to pursue truth in the way that you do, you, one day, will become a Muslim. So in the eyes of my friend Hamza and many others, uh, I am still somehow righteous, uh, that I am a religious man, right? So this doesn't necessarily represent the view of all individual Muslims. Most individual Muslims actually don't think this way um, because I quoted specific verses uh, from the Quran that said we were going to hell. Uh, I could also quote some verses that say we as Christians or as Jews will go to heaven. So there's a clear contradiction and conflict that exists. 
Uh, many say we'll go to heaven. Many say we'll go to hell as Christians. Um, and so the way to solve this, I'm trying to think, we'll get to, uh, we'll, we'll get to it later. Um, but that's in the Quran. Okay, I'll just get to it now. So uh, there's a doctrine uh, called the doctrine of abrogation in, Quran, in the Quran, uh, which means that verses or ayahs that are revealed later, I want to make sure I get that right, uh, supersede or cancel out revelations that are made early. I always make that phrase switch for some reason. Uh, but the ones that are revealed later cancel out the ones that are revealed earlier if they conflict. Right? And so when they conflict, and some say that we're going to heaven, some say we're going to hell, we have to see, well, which chapters were revealed to Muhammad later? And Surah 3 and Surah 5 are some of the later revealed revelations. Therefore, they cancel over, they supersede the other ones. So they're the ones that therefore are to be believed. But again, most Muslims I talk to say, ah, oh, you'll probably go to heaven. What's the organizational structure of the Quran? It's not chronological. We'll get to that. Thank you. Sorry, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Um, it might be worth pointing out something that is in one of the surahs that you quoted. So 572 says, those who believe say, Allah, he is the Messiah. He is Esau, the son of Mary. Meaning <laughs> that unbelievers say that Jesus is Allah. And then he says, whereas the Messiah himself said, O children of, Esh uh, of Israel, you should worship Allah, who is my Lord and your Lord. So they put, one of the key things they do is they don't set Jesus against Allah. They say that Jesus preaches Allah, is submissive to Allah, tells his followers to follow uh, Allah. And so there's more to, I mean, we understand that Jesus is one of their prophets. We don't really get the idea that what they do is they put it in the mouth of Jesus, the idea that you shouldn't worship me, I'm not God, you should worship Allah. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Thank you. Um, so, you, so you brought up the doctrine of abrogation, yeah. but is that... That's not a common thing that most Muslims hold to, or is that like a... Um, most scholars will. Uh, a lot of your typical Muslims, like a lot of your pew warmers, right, don't understand, say, a Christocentric reading of the text, which makes us not follow the dietary okay. laws. In the same way, most Muslims probably don't understand this, because uh, it's specifically referred to in two verses, or two ayahs, we'll get to that. So there's two ayahs uh, in the Quran that talk about the doctrine of abrogation, so then most Muslim scholars use that as an interpretive grid to interpret all of the Quran, of course. Um, but your average Muslim probably wouldn't know that or adhere to that or like that idea. But most Muslim scholars realize that this is a doctrine that should be applied to interpreting the Quran. There's a minority that don't, but most do. Most do. Most scholars oh, okay. agree that abrogation is an interpretive method that should be used for all of the Quran. I don't know if you're going to get to this, but it's worth noting that Islam goes from peaceful yeah. to warlike, and whereas the biblical religion, we also have a sort of yeah. an abrogation with the New Covenant and the Old Covenant, we go yeah. from warlike to peaceful, which has been interesting. I'll skip that slide. Please. What's that? I'll skip that slide. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you're good. No, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, misconceptions, uh, so things that Muslims think Christians believe, uh, again, as we just said, um, they believe that the doctrine of the Trinity means that we think there are three gods. I was about ready to bash my head into my steering wheel the other day. I was, as I mentioned, sitting with my friend Bender, same conversation, and uh, I was asking him some questions. He was getting ready to leave. I'll most likely never see him again. Um, and uh, we, we were talking about some of the things I've relayed to him, and he goes, you know, Ty, I just can't believe in Christianity because you believe in three gods. And I almost threw a book. I'm like, what the heck? Where do you... Where, I've literally spent so much time undermining the fact that we don't, uh, but yet for some reason uh, they can't see a distinguishing mark between the triune God, one in essence and three in persons, and as they see it, three gods. So Surah 5, Ayah 116, uh, Allah says, O Jesus, son of Mary, did men say to you, worship me and my mother as gods in the derogation of Allah? And Jesus says, Glory to me, glory to you, Allah. Never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such thing, you would have indeed known it. 
And so a lot apparently said to Jesus, hey, did you tell people? Did you tell people to worship you? And he just goes, no, I told people only to worship you, Allah, right? Um, and then, yeah, that's the, the text I was looking at, right? So they think that means we believe there's three gods. Now, the three gods they think we believe in are the Father, the Son, and Mary. Not all Muslims, but that's a common misconception uh, that they believe as well. Uh, and that's because of Surah 6, Ayah 101, which reads, sorry, getting there. Uh, to him is due the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. How can Allah have a son when he has no wife? Right? So if he has a son, that must have meant he had a wife who was married, who he came down to earth with and had some sort of sexual relations with. Therefore, the God the Christians believe in is three because they say God the Father and then they say Jesus, Son of God. But he had to be created by someone, so it must have been the progenitor of the one he was created by. It was Allah, but Allah must have had to, you know, have the Son of God with someone, so it must have been Mary. Um, so, that's what we're saying. Uh, Christianity is monolithic. Again, we always make, fall into this with Islam as well. I'm describing Islam as a whole, not every individual Muslim belief system. Right? I had a, a Muslim friend of mine the other day say, So you believe that priests shouldn't get married? And I said, why do you say that? He goes, well, I know Catholics believe that. And I said, you understand I'm not a Catholic, right? You're not? Right. So they oftentimes fall into the misunderstanding of, oh, I know a friend who's Catholic, or I know a friend who's Orthodox. You must be just like him, even though we're not at all like him. Uh, Christianity encourages godless and immoral lifestyles, right? Christianity is a free pass to get to heaven so you can live godless, rebellious lives filled with sin and revelry. What many Muslims believe. All right, we will continue.